trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soaked by Smush Podcast. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Soaked by Slush podcast. My name is William von der Palen and with me in Copenhagen is Isa Krauti in a brand new studio setting. What's in a up, brand Isak? new studio. Yes, you're right. Thank you so much. My name is Isa Krauti, uh, part of the Soaked by Slush podcast. As you all know, at this point, I did not move into a bigger house. This is a studio that I finally got that we uh, had arranged to us or I got arranged here in Copenhagen. Thank you for the student innovation house people here at CBS. Uh, how's, how are you doing, William? I'm great. It's it's uh, yeah. We're in November now when this is uh, recorded, so the weather is very slush-like. Uh, we're we're nearing you know the normal conference times of the year, and and it's it's starting to show in the weather. And and uh, yeah, as as we've seen, we we'll have to do with Node and and this mini version of Slush every week. But uh, we have it's not it's not so bad with guests uh, guests like uh, today. So uh, yes. welcome to the show, Lawrence Loishner from Tier. Hello everyone. How's it going? It's, it's great. going great. How's it going in Maybe. Berlin? You said you're in Berlin right now, Lawrence. Yes, I'm in Berlin. Uh, we still have light. Um, <laughs> I don't know about you guys. Um, nope. No. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm in Berlin. Um, currently in my in my home office, um, which I set up since March, and uh, yeah, um, things are going well. It's great. Uh, I thought we could um, start off as we usually do with with a brief introduction of, of who who you are. Most people uh, probably know what Tier is, but you know maybe you could give uh, give us a bit a bit of a background about who you are and what you've done uh, before Tier. Absolutely. So yeah, so I'm Lawrence. Um, I um, grew up in Germany, and uh, I actually started my entrepreneurial career very early when I took the returns of my dad's warehouse because he couldn't sell them anymore. And I was just uh, fed up with that, seeing those um, those uh, stuff always in the trash. And I decided to take them and go to the flea market. So I started the flea market business from, from nine years until I was 16. And um, I really learned uh, how to to buy and actually, actually sell stuff. Um, then I started a online company called Trade a Game, uh, which was buying and selling uh, used video games. So same category, secondhand but this time video games and the company turned out to be the biggest platform for second video games. And then I had the turning point of my, in my life. Um, I was watching an inconvenient truth by Al Gore, 2006. And it was uh, talking about how climate change is happening. So that's uh, 14 years ago. And uh, it really shocked me that we have to do something about climate change. And um, I, I thought about that. I have to do something on my side and I decided that I will, we brand trade the game to rebuy.com, which is uh, um, now the biggest platform for second hand electronics. So I was inspired uh, by this movie and said, I want to save resources. I want to do something in a circular economy. And that's why uh, we, we yeah went on a crazy journey with, with rebuy and we gave over 100 million products a second life, like phones and laptops and, and, and PlayStation, etc. So it was a very an environmental driven company and mission driven company to give products a second life. And then after this long period of second hand, starting from the flea market to trading and to rebuy, I decided to go on a, on a world trip. I want to do, uh, I want to go surfing and I want to see the world where the, the real climate change problems are. And I traveled in an old van for one and a half years around the world. And um, I really saw the, the big problems um, happening in areas where um, there's, there's no real solutions like we put a uh, forest problem, fire forests in, in Chile or mudslides in Peru, et cetera. And you can see all everywhere problems that are more and more uh, rising more and more. And I decided that I want to do um, a company again with a mission driven impact on, on our environment. And when I looked at the cost of climate change, I realized that um, transportation is the number one cause for climate change. So biggest emissions and that's why i uh, looked into the sector and i realized that there's an opportunity to get access to customers and drive change to a more green and, and more electric and more sustainable way of moving in cities 
that I started the company Tier um, in in July 18 and started operations in October with the mission to change mobility uh, for good. Exactly. Uh, was that based? Uh, obviously, you found uh, you had the data and you had a problem that you you needed to solve, and and then uh, obviously there was quite a lot of different scooter companies popping up around the world. We had Lime and and uh, uh, certain other uh, U.S. based uh, scooter companies. So, did you get your inspiration in part from from these companies, or or did you? Uh, was this like accidental in in a way that you also came came up with this idea in for Europe? No, well, I, I said to myself that at the end of the trip, I hopefully somehow uh, find my new idea, uh, my new mission. And at the very end of my trip, I was in San Diego surfing and I came out of the water and there was a scooter passing by and I was like, what is this? I was very surprised how happy the person was. Um, I interviewed the person. I realized, okay, this has a great product market fit. Um, so let's think about bringing that to, to Europe. And... Then digging deeper into it, I already saw that um, Lime was in Paris, but I said, you know, let's go for it. Um, we, we, if we do something differently and smarter and maybe more capital efficient, we can compete. And I'm very happy that um, now we are, uh, we had our anniversary two, uh, two weeks ago. So uh, now we're two years old um, being on the ground uh, operationally. And uh, I'm very happy that, that we actually took the lead in Europe uh, by the beginning of this year in, in all KPIs. And it, it shows me that when you think sustainable and the team thinks sustainable, that you can create um, a company that can compete with companies who have more uh, capital. So when you treat your scooters better, you repair them more, which was my background at Rewi. Um, when you take care of your customers more, if you take care of the city more, uh, have, have better partnerships, etc then you can actually compete against um, bigger companies with less capital. And uh, we, we proved that. And uh, I'm, I'm happy that I, that I took the challenge with my co-founders. Can you speak a bit more on those uh, aspects you just mentioned? Like, what do you think are the key, uh, key takeaways from, from your journey to being Europe's number one, uh, the most important things? And can you, can you speak a bit more on them? Like, uh, what, what was the thought process behind them? Yeah, sure. So when I looked at the business, it was pretty clear for me that when your scooter lasts only, um, let's say, a month at that time by competitors, um, but your revenues pay off the scooter after three months, you, you don't have a business model, right? Right. So the question was, can we increase the lifetime of the scooters to actually make money on the asset? Otherwise, you have to deploy more and more scooters so in my example, you would have to deploy three times assets uh, in three months and you will never make money because you need three months to make money. So that's why I said we need to increase the lifetime to six months minimum to make uh, a two X on the, on, the, on the invested capital of the asset. Um, and that cost a very different approach how we're going to run the company. So we said we're not going to use any gig working economy uh, we're going to have the own operations in our hands. So we will have a warehouse where we will repair the scooters because the gig working economy is structured in a way that private people take scooters off the road, charge them in their home space, and then they actually don't really care about quality and if there's a screw loose or whatever, and they don't repair. But if you want to offer a mobility service, you need to take care of your assets, and that's why you have to see them in a in a very um, a regular way, uh, like an inspection. Um, so you can repair and fix things. And also you want to offer a very safe service that you guarantee to the customer that's well maintained. So with that, with that approach, how we started, and we were the only one in the industry globally who took that approach of owning the operations and, and having own warehouses and own repairs, we managed now over time to get the lifetime of the scooters to over three years. So um, even after three years, we can resell after a, a more intense repair to customers um, that we already have done. So we have our own brand called MyTier that, that sold over the last seven months uh, thousands of thousands of, of, of secondhand scooters that we used in a sharing environment to consumers. So even though after repairing and using them for a couple of time, then we even give them a second life. And that kind of shows um, how we think about running a business. Um, and that was one of the success factors. 
I think also one of the success factors was that when we looked at the operations, we said, okay, if we have an asset that we can repay and it actually makes money, the question is how can we optimize the operations on the ground? And when we started our first fleet of scooters, we actually had a warehouse outside of the city where we were charging um, our scooters. So in the night, we have to drive into the city with our vans, collect the, the vehicles, put it into a van, and drive outside of the city into the warehouse, charge them for five, six hours, and then bring them back into the city and deploy them. And I was like, this is not very efficient. So in logistics and operations, you always um, try to reduce your touches. So my goal was to go to like a single or two times touch. And that's why we innovated the industry and we're the first one who deployed swappable battery scooters. So in December last year, we um, innovated a new scooter generation where actually our team has the batteries in front of them, carrying it with, a, with, a, with an electric cargo bike and swapping the batteries on the ground. So you open the deck, take the battery and put the new one in. It's like a, uh, um, it's a very quick process, like one minute. So that, that um, massively um, optimized the costs. So we decreased it by 50% of our operations. So the charging is like the main factor of our cost. And therefore we, we, we showed that we can actually in the winter time where there's less demand, we can actually be profitable on a, on a ridership basis on a unit basis. And that was like a second innovation that we brought to the industry. So on operation was the first one, second was the, the swap of battery. And now we are on the edge uh, of the third generation and uh, we have one pilot city of our 80, 80 cities, which is Tampere, um, uh, which you probably know. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And in this city Very we nice. deployed um, the new generation called the user swapping uh, charging stations. So you as a user um, rides the scooter and then you get a message and say, hey, you want to swap that battery, you, you can get the next ride for free then. So we can make rides completely uh, to zero, which is the most affordable price you can get. And um, then as a user, you go to a store which is close by. So we have um, over 50 locations in Tampere where you can take the battery, go into the store and there's our charging station and just take a new battery out, which is fully charged, put the old one in to recharge. Uh, you Most of the times you buy something in the store and then you go back to the vehicle and put the battery back in. It's a process of average 80 seconds and people love it. People do it on a regular basis and uh, more than more than 50% of our charges are now done by users. So we give the benefit of charging directly to the to the customer who can ride for free and the city loves it because we're building an energy infrastructure across uh, across the city without asking for uh subsidies etc uh, subsidies and um the the stores like it as well because they get additional revenues into the stores because people are spending money and um, for us we save a lot of costs which uh, helps us to to uh, be more profitable and offer better service and invest in other things so this is an example how we always try to innovate and and try to be the first one that sets the standards of sustainability and also of innovation that others will follow yeah i saw the tampere innovation uh, actually i thought that was a very good idea and it's like when you see it you think like okay how how is this not not happening more uh, so i think that's a good idea and probably something that will work in other cities than tampere <laughs> uh, as well uh, but obviously the scooter landscape is super competitive there's like uh, many big big firms also in europe and and small ones popping up trying to get uh, small market shares so how hard is it to stay you know true to basically your values while doing this innovation or is it the other way around that actually staying true to your values helps you create the the right kinds of innovations and uh, and uh, yeah just develop the company i mean for us the, the values are, are are always the starting point so your values define your behaviors and uh, your behaviors should drive and and achieve the kpis you're setting but I give you one example about value. So when 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 the first lockdown came into place in end of March, um, 
we were sitting there. We didn't know what's going to happen. We just knew that there's a lockdown. We didn't even know if there's a um, a, a infection risk on the scooters. We didn't know how the city's going to react if they say, "Hey, you have to go off the off the street." Uh, we didn't know if people going to continue to be on the road. There was a lot of uncertainty in a very difficult time for for the mobility industry because it was spring and everybody was like ready to scale up and be ready for summer. And also, every city and countries were were doing different things uh, and behaving differently. Some had lockdowns, some had soft lockdowns, some had some restrictions, some said, you know what, we just continue. So it was a very intense time in those two, three weeks. And we were seeing that uh, not only the stock market crash, but also all our competitors, doesn't matter if it's the Europeans or the US players, they all laid off minimum 20% of their people. And I'll, I remember sitting there and I was discussing with the team who said, it was pretty clear for us. We said, um, we went all together through the good times. Uh, we will also stick together in the bad times. And um, we communicated to the board that we will find solutions. We're going to be smart. We, we are going to build a, an adjusted plan. Uh, we will try to uh, find solutions that we can still generate revenues. And I remember I, be, I got a call from our um, GM in, 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 in Finland. Her name is Katja. And she was telling me, Lawrence, we, we, we should not go off the, off the road. She was like, she was more like this big Viking style saying, I'm not going off the road. That was, that, that was what she's saying. And I said, like, why? She said, yeah, we, we have to be here for the people who need us um, for like those important jobs. And the city um, wants us to stay here because there's people going to the hospital, um, people who are doing the groceries for others, etc. So we said, okay, that's a role model um, of, of an employee of here that we care and that we, we actually uh, want to be there in a situation where not everything's fine. And then we decided we do not any layoffs we're going to actually continue with the operations where we're allowed to help the cities to, to, to create rights for people who need them um, with like um, millions of millions of free rights. And uh, when everybody left, uh, left the field and everybody um, stored the scooters in their, in their warehouses, um, um, we, we, we actually gained a lot of market share. And um, that caused then that we created the clear European leadership and that also caused that we uh, now close a, a, a great round and I think it all, all goes back to the, the first point when I was saying is it's based on the values that created the behaviors that um, we took and the decisions we made um, to continue. There's not many, if I just think about personally, there's not many uh inventions in the past few years that have changed the look of the cityscape uh, as much as uh, electric scooters uh, such as Tier. Uh, and while any everyone in cities aren't still aren't using them, everyone has an opinion about them because they are so uh, prevalent everywhere and they're I'm, I'm guessing i mean you probably know this more than more than well uh, it's it's from it's, it's from every direction there's opinions about this so how do you go about dealing with this and and what is it that you hear and how how is this uh, how is it balancing these uh, things i mean first of all we have to be very open and we also i mean we always have to listen to every opinion that's out there as much as we can i mean we can't do every every opinion, but we have to be very open in every market where we are. We have to be very close to the city. We do a lot of research. We talk to our customers. We have a 24-hour um, customer telephone hotline, and we, we try to get as much as inside as possible. And it's true. Um, uh, we are, uh, as we are, as we're quite visible in the cities, um, we draw attention. And there are people who who see that as a huge benefit of um, transforming the cities to be more sustainable and driving electric vehicles instead of taking a taxi ride or maybe even think about selling the car because there's other solutions. And um, and there's also when when always new things come to a city or come into the uh, into the eyes into the perception of people, um, people will criticize things and say, okay, why is the scooter here and why is it not there? 
uh, is it really driving a change, etc. And and some questions are great because they make us better and and reflect us how we can make the the business model better and more sustainable and find solutions. Um, but there's always people who just like don't want to change at all, and uh, we more, for, for most of them we can't do anything because. Uh, time is always changing, um, but we take uh, feedback very serious, uh, and there's a lot of stuff we have to optimize and do better, um, and that's why we're trying to continuously to innovate. Do you have a tip for me and William? Because as this podcast gets bigger and bigger and becomes huge worldwide, a massive phenomena, we're probably going to get the same type of uh, feedback, both positive and negative. So how do we find the gold nuggets in the bad, uh, bad uh, feedback? I think you, I mean, there is a way when you, when you really listen to certain people where you think it's a very, very valuable feedback. So some people give feedback and I, I call it in a negative way. They just criticize. And there's people who might listen to your podcast and say, hey, Isaac and William, um, I, I'm, I'm listening now for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. I think it's turning into a X, Y, Z. And then you realize the person wants to do something good for you. It, it's a positive message that's, that, that the person wants to send to you. And then I think that's a great conversation where you can get something out of it and, and learn. And then you can decide for yourself. I mean, if there's a feedback, uh, I always say when I get feedback, I take it for minimum 24 hours and sleep over it. And then I might have not a, an allergic reaction because I think I get offended. But um, after sleeping over it, you realize maybe there's something I want to change. And then you, you try to um, check against your values and against your goals you had for the podcast and say, yeah, this is what I intended to do. This is, this is why, how I see the, the podcast. And uh, I think it's a great feedback, but I want to go my way. Or you say, yeah, I think it's a very good feedback. I, I, I should change something. So I think... Um, making sure you get the feedback from the people that you really want to have the feedback, um, which is positive and like open people. Um, and second, think about the feedback in, in, in quietness and realize if you want to change something and it needs to be a, a conscious decision and not a quick reaction. Mm. Yeah, that Great sounds tips. better than what I did this morning with, with some <laughs> feedback I got. But yeah, <laughs> what, what was the feedback where you got? Uh, it was a feedback from our uh, from our Finnish uh, podcast uh, about something uh, I don't even remember anymore. But it it was uh, it was relatable. Uh, I think it's 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 a good way for for basically also any business to uh, to ob- obviously take it seriously. Most people I think who who give feedback uh, still take their time to to write it and are serious with it. Ob- obviously, there's always going to be people who who do it just for they they want to see a reaction or criticize you. But most people still you know don't take the time to to write feedback to a business if they don't care on some level. So you should absolutely uh, try to appreciate that. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, positive right. feedback um, is is the best way you can grow yourself, right? Um, exactly. And I appreciate a lot when people take time and do it in a nice way and say, "Hey, Lawrence, um, there's something I want to talk with you about it." Um, and that's that's something we should really value. And I think it's it's we sometimes um, don't see how much uh, people also have to overcome certain struggles, and um, they they sometimes are shy about giving a feedback. But if somebody opens up and gives a feedback, I think it's a great moment. Where, where we should uh, get m- most out of it and appreciate yeah. it afterwards. It's a good uh, it's a good uh, approach because I think if you're putting anything out there, you're at the same time you're giving people permission to have an opinion about it. So you should you should not uh, be you should not be reactive when someone suddenly has an opinion about it. Like what's yeah. what? This is the it's it's uh, it's not a I, I I like your approach. It's a very good uh, philosophy on it. Exactly. Uh, yeah, let's talk a bit about fundraising. Obviously, this uh, industry has um, seen a lot of massive rounds from from uh, Lime and from Voy, and and now you just read about your latest uh, funding round. So, congrats on that, and and you're obviously in a big, uh, in a very capital intensive industry where there is a lot of competition. So you need to 
need to try to to win some markets and and just get a bigger market share because it seems like it's some form of survival of the fittest going on that n- not all these uh, electric scooter companies will survive but um maybe you know how do you approach um, the the funding round or funding rounds and and what are some of the questions investors ask you at this stage obviously because you're not the only uh electric <laughs> mobile or like mobility company they're looking at probably i, I thought um, we are the only one <laughs> there's <laughs> a few i think there's a few other ones <laughs> yeah i heard about it no 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 i mean we we have a very very uh, tough competition um and i see I take a correlation to sports. So I think you can only be very exceptional and 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 train harder and harder and be better and try to innovate and and work on yourself if you have someone who competes with you who pushes you to the next level. And therefore I think competition is in general something very good because you improve. Um And clearly, it's a very competitive environment. So I would not bother to have two or three competitors instead of like five, six. But I think over time, it will consolidate and people will drop out and see maybe I do something else or um, there's there's acquisitions, etc. So I think over time, there will be like two or three players um, that are uh, in the market. And I also believe in coexistence, right? So um, even if we think about survival of the fittest, there's still room for a tiger and a leopard in the jungle. So I think um, I don't see this. Uh, I'm, I'm not planning to build a monopoly. So I think there's a great coexistence. And even our, our user swap of a battery network that we are um, rolling out now, um, this, this is open for other players. So we already got inbounds of people saying, hey, I have a cargo bike or I have a logistic solution Can I use your battery and can I use the the energy network? So we're opening opening this up. So I think there will be more collaboration in the in the future between players between certain players. And uh, for the fundraising questions, I mean, um, I mean, there's a bunch of questions, right? I mean, they are they can compare the companies quite well uh, because others are also raising. Um, but at the end, I think they're looking. They're looking really what the company has achieved, yeah. So not only the last two weeks, so they're looking really back from how much capital they have, did they execute, um, what did they innovate. But I think the the most important thing as an investor, I believe, and that's the feedback we got, is that they have to trust the team. They have to trust the leadership team and the whole company that they can take the company from now to a next level and a next level for the next five to 10 years. And um, this is the relationship that you're building with the investor on that the investor says, okay, this is the team I want to back. So um, at the end, trust in people. And uh, uh, and I always say, if you want to, if you want to look where somebody goes, look where the, the person comes from. And then you realize if I can trust that, this person can can go uh, uh, the way. Yeah, because obviously, as an investor, you're buying into a big vision of the future since the valuations are getting quite big with the funding rounds getting bigger and bigger. And and obviously, if you do the math as an investor, you're going to realize that even though there's room for coexisting, some companies are aren't going to make it. As you said, it's, it's obvious that there's going to be some consolidation on the market at some point. So yeah, it's it's a team, and then probably you you have to paint some some uh, <laughs> some story or some you have to convince them that you you have a, a good future for for them and their money, and and it's gonna return <laughs> somehow. Sure, I mean you gotta be you gotta have big ambitions, and gotta be you got you gotta be somehow a warrior in this game. Like if you wanna play a very relaxed um, business and and you don't like competition and that's not the right thing for you. So either you accept that you are, uh, um, uh, you need to fight to win, right? Fight in a positive way. Um, then, then, then you have to accept it. Uh, you can't, uh, hate the players. Then you have to hate the, the, the game and we love the game. So we are very happy and we grow a lot. 
I personally made great experience uh, um, in the last couple of uh, yeah two years. And um, I think personal growth and the growth of everyone in the company is uh, super important. And that, that's also a big part of um, being in this business. How hard is it to kind of let go? Uh, because you're growing so fast, you can't obviously do everything yourself. Uh, maybe when you start off in the beginning, you... you look at every detail, try to be everywhere. And then at some point you probably realize that this is this is not a good idea. And, and this is often discussed that it's pretty hard as a founder to kind of let go of certain areas um, and, and delegate them and, and in that way focus on your own strengths and, and which in turn in turn or in turn then helps the, the whole company scale faster. So how has that been hard for you to kind of let go of certain areas or how have you approached that? Yeah, I mean, I I'm I went through the journey with my last company where I built a team of 700 people over 10 years, and now we built over 700 people in less than uh, 24 months. Um, so even I had the experience before. It's it's different if you build it at that pace. So the culture is always a challenge when you go that fast because you want to build an environment for diversity, for different opinions, and uh, different styles of of working but there's only certain limits that you can actually um, do that because we have to run, everyone has to run pretty fast and everybody has to improve very fast. Um, so I think that's one of the big challenges when you run a company that pays that your culture um, um, develops over time in the right direction. And that's why I said values, behaviors and KPIs is, is a very important stream that we are focusing more and more that when you set the values right, that the team makes the right decisions with their behaviors. And when we have that across the company, I as a CEO don't have to uh, uh, go in a helicopter style and make decisions in certain areas because uh, I know that people are making the right calls. For that, you need right people. I mean, you need the people who, best case, had the experience before, who were running uh, um, were capable of, of, of having the, the first of all, having the expertise of the area, but also having the capabilities to be a great leader. And being a great leader is something you have to you have to own it. You can't like read it in the book overnight. So you have to um, you have to make your experiences over a long time. Uh, and it's a it's a never ending uh, life experience. So I think creating. So bringing in great leaders um, in our specific project here at the early time and developing more great leaders in the company is something we're really focusing on, which helps me to um, focus on the very important things, which is vision, direction, and and, and alignment and key hires. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a complete new experience also for me here. You've uh, you've mentioned a few times that you're a very mission driven company, especially in terms of climate and wanting to mitigate climate change <clears throat> and just be environmentally friendly, change the ways in which people move in cities uh, into a more ecological uh, way. How do you? This is a question that's interesting when this comes up. I think it's it's uh, it's how do you measure that? How do you know that that's actually what's ha- happening? Uh, and and are you ever faced with difficult decisions where you have a trade off between uh, uh, maybe growth or, or market entry or or these sort of long term goals that you know you will achieve in the long term, but you might have this sort of immediate choice you have to make or this immediate trade off be- between some decisions yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, um, for me, this is this is truly mission driven. Um, it started with the, for us, uh, change mobility for good. This is like the first thing we, that came to our mind that what we want to do, and all the decisions we have made been, been uh, very sustainability driven. So one example is, we decided that we have to measure more the impact that we have. So the impact is. Um, how much of a car ride or a non-sustainable ride we are replacing. And then we do research and we found out, hey, 30% of our riders would have taken a car or an equivalent which has emissions. And that creates also benchmark for us to improve further to say, hey, let's go to 40, let's go to 50%. Because I don't want to, repl- I don't want to replace walking. Um, 
and I don't want to replace biking. I want to replace um, um, the car rides. I want to replace um, certain connections where people um, um, take a cab or something equivalent. So that's why I think measuring your impact is very important that you can see what the impact is. Um, another example is that we decided to, to, to I mean, we are a climate negative company. So um, we are um, offsetting more CO2 emissions because of our business model. So we are reducing carbon emissions, but we also said we want to be um, um, carbon neutral within the company. So all the emissions that we have, I made a review with an external agency and said, hey, how many emissions are we causing by production of the vehicles, the transport and the operations within our warehouses in our 80 cities? And it came out, we have to offset uh, uh, millions of CO2 emissions. And I decided, okay, let's do it. Um, if there's no way we can we can take an electric boat or an electric uh, vehicle to take the scooter from China to Europe, uh, and we're taking the train, then we have to, we have to um, uh, set it off. Um, and we have to plant trees and, and uh, work on a, on a CO2 emission project to completely offset it. And there was a situation when the lockdown was that we could not ship our scooters because we wanted to wait uh, what's going to happen with the situation because we couldn't deploy all the scooters. And then, then suddenly the demand the popped back and we said, okay, now we need to have the scooters very quickly. And then the question was, yeah, maybe we just fly them. And I was like, yeah, we can fly them and cause many CO2 emissions or we stick to our uh, commitment we have made at the end of last year. We said we're not going to fly any scooters. Um, and then we said, yeah, we're not going to fly any scooters. We're going to take um, trains. Um, it's going to take longer. We might not hit our business plan, but we decided we go for it. Um, so, yes, sometimes there are hard calls. For me, they're not hard calls anymore because I think if you're doing it sustainable in the long term, you always um, be more profitable, more successful. You keep people longer in the company, you have better relations with your city. So therefore, um, if you're mission driven and sustainability is a key part of being mission driven, I think, then um, I think you are more successful in the long term. One thing that you often hear from people who work in fast growing startups is kind of, um, you know, when you grow that fast, you go from zero to 700 in two years. There's bound to, as you said, in order for you to not be so hands-on with everything, you need to create processes and, and uh, alignment. Uh, but how do you ensure that, you know, you don't become very rigid in the process of that? Um, so you don't create unnecessary bureaucracy that then, you know, kills creativity, kills uh, kills the very foundation of what made you great in the in the beginning pace and uh, innovation and all that or is it something that you're gonna have to compromise on along the way a little i mean there's we have to transform our organization continuously uh if you're growing from three founders to 20 people then to 50 to 100 to five i mean we are very close to a thousand people now and you can't run the company as you have been running it with 10 people where everybody was in a room and said okay App release, yes, no, okay, yes, that's a change we make. Um, this is the design and everyone's sitting in a room and everybody made kind of uh, every decision. Um, so you need to have certain functions to take responsibility and those those functions have to have to make the calls. Uh, you can't have this all up to the to the sea level to make decisions. So that also means that uh, we are not involved in everything. That also means that certain teams have certain um, decision making and there's a decision making process um, that you don't uh, regret certain certain decisions um, and over time that there's compliance and there's um, data privacy etc i mean there's all kind of things that come along when you go bigger and bigger that you have to step up and be more professional um, with onboarding um, even offboarding uh, contracts. Um, comp I mean, we are in 10 countries, so in every country there's different rules um, about labor laws. So therefore, um, you have to be actually on top of that, which means not everything goes as fast as in the beginning, but that's the nature of building a company. I think we always have that startup mentality. Um, and um, even I think if we're 10 years old, we're not a 
and a, a, a corporate, we still see ourselves as a startup. So I think um, there needs to be changes, but you always have to keep your spirit and need to make sure that you hire the right people who can make quick decisions. Otherwise, you you sit in meetings after meetings after meetings, and then you don't know at the end of the day what actually happened with the day. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I spoke to Brad Bao, who was one of the founders of Lime. Uh, I spoke to him a few weeks ago, and he said that in the quite in the beginning of the company, they, or, or his opinion was that you have to choose one thing that you're really great at and then kind of suck <laughs> at everything else uh, to actually make something good. Is this something that you've followed in, in building tier that you focused on, on one area in the beginning to, to go through or is this, how do you view this? Yeah, I think, um, I, I think I agree. Um, I think it's, it's, it's important that you focus in the beginning, your, your resources on one thing you're really good at. I mean, there are other things you also have to be aware of and you have to do, but um, the prime focus for us in the beginning was to build more efficient operations. And we put all our efforts from tech, from from my attention, um, the ma- majority of the management team was in operations to build um, a, a profitable business, right? So if you, if you don't figure out how to run a uh, mobility company, Uh, the most efficient way, then you can't um, add more users and add more countries because then your problem gets bigger and bigger and you multiply your problems. Um, so I think um, we focus very much in the beginning on operations and make it as um, efficient as possible, long lifetime repairing on operations, etc. as I said. So yeah, I think uh, focus in the beginning is very important. Why should people become entrepreneurs now? What do you think they should? We talked before the episode that... Uh... The question is more, why why shouldn't they? Um, yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> first of all, every, I think being an entrepreneur has a lot of pros and cons. Mm. Um, but I think if people think about being an entrepreneur, um, people should try it out and see how it is because mm. it's, It's for me, it's the only thing that I can imagine to do in my life. And I never worked for somebody else. And I realized in the very early beginning that I have to do something by my own. Um, And if you do something, I believe that everybody is very good at something. And it doesn't matter what it is. It can mean you are a great painter or you are a great musician or you're a great soccer player or whatever. There's something that you have um that you 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 should be good at and that means also that not everybody should be an entrepreneur because it uh, it is not uh, um always the case um that that everybody um should be an entrepreneur and is, is good at, at being an entrepreneur so um if people are thinking about it to be an entrepreneur then i always say just do it um The downside of it is very small because I think there's ways of um, finance yourself. So when I built my first business, I was I had three different jobs uh, where I was like uh, earning money, um, and those jobs were um, I mean I was self-employed, but I made some money, and I was like doing promotion and all kind of stuff. Um, but I financed my my own business. Um, to to pay uh, to pay my 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 rent etc. And if you if you if you make that call, it's maybe a tough time for a couple of months, and you realize okay this is working or it's not working, or then you realize I don't know it's in between, but I can't do everything at the same time. Then you have to be more bold, and you have to go to your parents and say hey give me a give me a loan uh, for for six months. Uh, I, I, I give me some cash for the next six months. I will pay back the next 10 years. Uh, and you don't need much money if you're focusing on your on building your own stuff. So I think um, um, there is a cliff where people think about, should I do this or not? Uh, but I would ask myself, what happens uh, if, if, I, if I do this? Um, and what is, really, what is really the downside? Because the upside is you're going to learn a billion things Uh, because you have to do everything by yourself in the beginning and you will get out of your comfort zone. You will meet great people. Um, you will learn something if you're building an app or 
um, building a marketplace or doing anything offline, it doesn't matter what it is. So at the end, I think you will always be smarter. And the question is only how to get over the cliff. And to get over the cliff, it's only you to make the call to say, okay, let's do this. One argument that people often have why they shouldn't start or why they aren't starting yet is that they don't have a good idea and that's that's something you hear very often and um, that's why I asked you also in the beginning about you know where did you get the idea okay you saw a scooter in in uh, America and then you thought hey why not bring that to Europe uh, so is this something you think you go, do you think you need to have like an original idea why why wouldn't you just look at what's happening around you and, and try to make that better I think there's a bunch of people who have great ideas but most of the ideas they don't get materialized and that's the ones who who actually execute the idea so i think there's plenty of ideas like if you go with an open mind around and if you look at if you read a bit about markets and other countries and places so even if you don't innovate something completely new yeah and it had never been here before which is very rare because everything is a copy of a copy right um But if you think like I'm not able or I didn't find something that I I really want to innovate from scratch, then look at something you you see that you like, but you think you can do better. You can build it more customer friendly. You can build it more efficient. You can build it international. You can build it at a national level, not at a local level. So there's all kind of ways how to approach a a, a business idea, um, and that's why I think. Um, There's an, there's enough ideas out there still. Yeah, I mean, there's this uh, rocket internet, I believe, was founded on the idea of just copying uh, working ideas and bringing them to new markets. Um, so, I mean, and that turned out quite well. Um, so, and a lot of good success stories come from, and, and I don't know why people are afraid of copying or like, like I can steal that idea. It's It's not like one company will have a monopoly on the whole global market of anything. And it's not like it's not happening every day, so. Maybe that's something that yeah. can help a lot of people get started. Yeah, and I think it, it doesn't have to be. I think people sometimes think they have to do build something completely new, right? So if I look around here in my in my in my home office, I have a peloton where I do my uh, bicycle training right now, and it's a it's a home it's a bicycle it's a home trainer, right? I had a home trainer when I was 16. It was it was super shit. And it was like clunky and it was like annoying to ride. Everyone was like, can you go in the basement? Like you're annoying us. <laughs> and after three times when you got it to Christmas, you don't use it anymore. But they just innovated and made it really nice with like an interactive uh, screen, etc. cetera. Uh, same with like Spotify. There was Napster before. Um, and it was, it, was, it was cool to have all the music, but it was illegal. So they figured out to make it legal. So I think there's a lot of potential of all kinds of ideas how to make things better um, without like completely innovating the world because that's that's pretty hard. Yeah. Thank you, Lawrence. This has been a very, very interesting episode. I don't know if you have questions anymore, William. I don't want to cut you off if you <laughs> if you still have something. Yeah, maybe, but thank you. Maybe this has been before very... we end, if you have time for one yeah. one more question is is just um You know, uh, where do you see the the market going uh, in terms of e-scooters now? Um, as we discussed before the episode, there seems to be, at least in Great Britain now, we've seen I've seen quite a lot of posts about um, certain scooter companies taking uh, having rights in in certain markets and that being that being erased there. And then you see the same with with city bikes. Uh, so do you think uh, this is the direction that it will go into that you will work uh, much cl- in, in in closer cooperation with authorities and there will be maybe one or two maybe three scooter brands per city and, and you will create this kind of a bigger service infrastructure and and a bigger cooperation with cities in the future yeah i think as a european company you have to be close to the city as much as possible um I, if our mission i mean our mission is change mobility for good and you, we can change mobility for good Uh, without the city together. Um, our approach is never go into a city and just like deploy scooters. So we always go first to the city and talk about, hey, this is our plan. This is how we want to do it. Are you okay with it? And if we get confirmation, then we plan together how we're going to do the rollout. And then we are in, in keep the contact. So I think as a European player and, and, and being part of, of 
and European DNA and having the mission of change mobility for good. I think it's really important to be close to cities. And then let's see. I mean, it's going to be uh, an exciting next uh, next year and to be continued. And um, I think uh, I believe in coexistence. Um, but some people might say, hey, maybe I, I should leave the jungle and I do something else. Awesome. Best of luck on on the, your continued journey, and uh, yeah, I'm going going yes. now to eat. Maybe see if I can find find a tear outside the door, so I can, <laughs> I can ride yeah. one and contribute to that. But uh, thanks for, for thanks for your for your time and insights. It was very enjoyable, and uh, thanks to everyone who watched the video or listened to the audio. Uh, comment what you think. Who's your favorite scooter company? Who would be a good guest? Anything. And uh, we'll see you next week again. Thanks. Yes, Bye. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you for your time, and thank you, viewers and listeners. Stay safe. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye. You.